Breaking news, Canon has released a new firmware update for the Canon R6 and 1DX Mark III, and it's a really big deal. It removes an artificial limitation that they put in there basically to hamper the capabilities of their own cameras. And now that it's unlocked, we have an extremely powerful video-centric camera at a price point that hasn't yet been available. And I'm gonna tell you about it and why it's going to be enough for me to switch from my Sony a7S III over to the Canon R6. First, I wanna thank our sponsor, Squarespace. I just this weekend started making a new website for my daughter. And even as a 17 year old who's never made a website before, she can make it in just a few minutes. Drag in a few images, type a little bit about yourself, put in videos, pick a template that matches your own personal style, and now, bam, you have a web presence with your own private domain so much better than social media. Don't take my word for it. Head to squarespace.com slash Tony. Try it out for yourself. And when you love it, use the coupon code Tony and get 10% off. Thank you, Squarespace. Well, today's firmware update was for the R6 and 1DX Mark III. I expect a firmware update with these same capabilities to soon come for the Canon R5, hopefully within a month. The first of the two new features for this is already in the Canon R5. That is Canon Log 3, C Log 3. If you aren't regularly shooting log and video, I'll tell you about it quickly. Log basically adds more dynamic range to your video file, kind of doing what raw files do compared to JPEG. When you use any log video format, you're able to pull down the highlights and pull up the shadows more. This means if you're shooting a really high contrast scene, like a subject standing in front of a sunset where the sun is back there, you'll be able to properly expose the sunset and pull up the shadows in your subject to have a scene that looks good. Here's an example of what your old options and your one new option look like before and then after processing. You can see both logs look much better than the standard in this high dynamic range situation, but C-Log 3 looks just a tiny bit better. Logs have a lot of disadvantages, something that we've learned in real world shooting. The log files require more careful exposure and that means you have to slow yourself down a little bit as you're filming. The log files also require additional processing, which slows things down. And unless you absolutely nail the exposure, you almost always end up with really noisy shadows. After really experimenting with different log formats for the more than 1,100 videos that we've made for this channel, we decided we weren't going to use log on a regular basis. Instead, we do things like just add light to reduce the contrast to the scene. However, we do still occasionally use log when the contrast is unavoidable and we need to be able to balance the highlights and the shadows like that. It's this new feature that I in particular am really excited about. Canon is allowing you to finally record video to two card slots simultaneously, something you haven't been able to do before. This seems weird. Both of these cameras have two card slots. They will both allow you to take pictures and write them to both card slots. But as soon as you started recording video, it would only ever write to one card slot. After installing the firmware update, I am able to record video to two card slots. The second card slot is not a proxy like it is when recording AK video on the R5. This is an exact duplicate of the original video file. For some reason, every time we talk about the importance of shooting to two card slots, people get very emotional about it. And I think because there is this divide, a lot of people have cameras that do not have two card slots and it's never been a problem for them. And so they think, well, if it hasn't been a problem for me, then it must not be a problem for anybody. Well, a couple of years ago, we polled over 4,000 photographers, the biggest poll like this that has ever been done. And we asked them what types of media they were using, what brands, and whether they'd had any failures. The most meaningful bit of data that came from it is this chart here. Over on the left, you see the failure rate for people who've shot less than 10,000 photos. You can see about one third of people who shot less than 10,000 photos had had some kind of SD card failure in their career. But that number gradually increases with the number of photos that people have taken up to the point where if people have taken over a million photos, over three quarters of them have had some kind of SD card failure. Speaking for Chelsea and myself, we've had mm, probably half a dozen SD card failures over our career, but maybe more significantly, we've had quite a few corrupted video files. 
especially since we switched to higher bitrate formats like shooting in 4K60. What that last slide shows us is there's a direct correlation between how much data you generate and how much of that data suffers from some kind of problem. And this instinctively makes sense, right? If you're shooting video at 1080 and 30 frames per second, and you switch to shooting in 4K at 60 frames per second, as we do when we record our out of the studio stuff, you are increasing the amount of data you're recording eightfold, eight times. And that means that the chances of there being some kind of corruption probably also increase by about eight times. We started shooting with the Sony A7S III when it was launched, I think maybe a year ago or so. Since then, we have had two video files corrupted. Now, we've recorded more than 100 videos, and many of those have many different video files, even dozens of video files. So to have two video files corrupted in that amount of time doesn't sound bad. But in both of those cases, it would have screwed up an entire day of filming, and it would have cost us quite a bit of money. We would have had to have gone back and reshoot, or in editing, we would have had to use B-roll and voiceovers to try to get coverage. But Thanks to the fact that the Sony a7S III records video to two card slots, as soon as I detected that I couldn't import this corrupted video file, all I did was I just popped the card out of the second card slot and imported the backup copy of that file. In both cases, I was using Sony Tough cards, either an SD card or a CF Express Type A card, so very high quality cards. And in both cases, the card continued to work fine after that, and I continue to use those cards today. It's probably just some sort of anomaly when writing the data to the card, or it could just be as simple as one bit that didn't get recorded correctly because that can be enough to corrupt an entire video file. So if you're professionally shooting, think about all the different scenarios where you might be completely screwed over if a video file were corrupted. You know, if you're a wedding photographer slash videographer and you set up the camera, and what if it gets corrupted right before they say, I do. Like, how are you gonna go back and put together a proper video without that moment? Even if you're just recording, I don't know, your kid's soccer game or their concert or something, like how's it gonna feel when you get that random bit of corruption at the wrong time and you don't have a backup for it? So for us, I loved shooting video with the Canon R6 previously, but I had to choose the Sony a7S III because it recorded video to two card slots. And as you can see, that choice paid off as it's saved us twice. Canon's firmware update is great. They should have done this from the beginning. I can't even imagine why they didn't, but they still left the 30 minute recording limit in there, which is incredibly frustrating. But maybe it's a moot point because I tested this recording 4K 60 to both card slots and it overheated after 30 minutes. So that 30 minute recording limit, whether from the artificial software limit or from the overheating, that still exists for this particular camera. However, I don't mind that. For these in-studio videos, I frequently go over 30 minutes, but we record through an HDMI port, so overheating isn't a problem. For the out and about videos, we record in shorter segments, like five to 10 minutes at a time, and then we stop and we move to another location and we continue recording. So overheating, when I did shoot with the R6 after the initial firmware updates, overheating was not a problem. So this is coming together to mean that the R6 is gonna be a better all-around choice for us and the way we record our YouTube videos. I wanna do a side-by-side -side comparison of the Sony a7S III that we've been shooting with, that we shot hundreds of videos on, and the Canon R6 that I'm gonna be shooting with from this point forward. The Canon R6, $2,500, while the Sony a7S III is $3,500. So the R6, thousand bucks cheaper, that's great. The biggest factor for me is that the R6 has far better sensor stabilization. The R6's stabilization is so good that I do not need to use a gimbal. With the A7S III, I have to put it on this big rig if we're doing any kind of out and about walking shots. Chelsea frequently films me and we wanna use the gimbal, but this is just too heavy for her. So she can record for a couple of minutes at a time and then she has to stop. You can get the same gimbal-like effect hand holding the Canon R6 and that is amazing, and it means we have less to carry, there's one less thing that's gonna break or run out of batteries, and overall, it just allows our on-the-go videos to go a lot smoother. The R6 also has better video quality than the Sony a7S III, and some people reject this because the a7S series has such a powerful reputation for low-light performance, but the R6, slightly better in low-light, and also generally more detailed images. 
because the A7S III is doing a one-to-one -one readout for 4K video. It has one pixel for every pixel that it outputs. The R6 is downsampling from 5.1K video. That's part of the reason it overheats. It's actually doing more work. But that means you get visibly sharper images. It's not a huge difference. It's only a tiny bit better. The A7S III is excellent. We've been shooting with it. It's fine. I can't complain. But it's a little bit better, right? As I mentioned, the R6 has a 30-minute limit. It's okay for how we shoot. It's not going to be okay for everybody else, though. The Sony, you can record for two hours at 4K60, and we've never had a problem with it. Another big thing that I will miss about the Sony is that it has hot shoe microphones. I can digitally connect this in, and look, no cables here. It also gets power from the camera. So whether I'm shooting with a shotgun mic or a wireless lav, I, that's one less thing I have to charge one less thing that can fail, and no cable that can come loose. One of the big reasons I really enjoy shooting with the Canon cameras is excellent touch settings. On the Sony, I have dials that I can use to change the aperture and the shutter speed, but on the Canon, I can actually touch the screen while I'm in front of the camera, allowing me to adjust the ISO, aperture, shutter speed, and exposure compensation, and I find that to be incredibly convenient. The Canon also has the ability to scrub through video when you're reviewing it. So after we capture a clip, I like to watch it back, make sure that it didn't screw up anywhere, make sure that the clip is intact, and make sure that there's sound even at the end of the video. I rarely do this on the Sony because it has very primitive VCR-like controls that I have to like fast forward through. And if you record a 30-minute clip, it takes a long time to kind of get to the end and make sure that it works. With the Canon, I can just scrub through with my finger and immediately find out whether it worked. And so I'm actually more likely to check it on location on the Canon, which means there's a lower chance that I'm going to get back to the editing bay and find out that something went wrong. Another big advantage for the Sony is it just has more and better mirrorless lenses. Like what I have attached here now is the 24F14, which is excellent for vlogging and out and about video. It's nice and small, super good quality. That F14 gives me the background blur that I absolutely love. Canon doesn't have anything like that in the mirrorless world. We own the old Canon DSLR lens, so I can put that on an EF to RF adapter, but what you end up is with is a heavy and audibly loud autofocusing lens. In the comments down below, let me know what you think. I'm sure some people always freak out when I'm switching camera systems. It's fine. I'm polycamerous. I have all this gear anyway. I want to thank our sponsor Squarespace, which is the perfect way to make any website, whether it's for your photography portfolio, your multiple photography portfolios, in case you want to have separate branding for things like wedding, boudoir, fine art, which you should do, or whether it's your restaurant or your dental office or whatever it happens to be. Get your own private domain so you're not at gmail.com anymore and set it up for free at squarespace.com slash Tony. Try it out. If you love it, use the coupon code Tony and get 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace.